you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Yes, you've been so faithful, you, God. God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. You've been faithful, God. Thank you, yes. God. Yes. Thank you, You've God. You've been so faithful. Come on now. The blood that Jesus shed for me, he way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me
for the blood. Yeah. I'm so glad that access to God was not dependent upon my goodness. For we would have never got in. I can just speak for me. I'm so thankful that it wasn't based on my goodness because the door would have been shut. I'm so thankful that it was based, was not based on my intelligence because I ain't too bright. I would have been a mess. I'm so thankful that it wasn't based on our income because we would have been shut down. But it's based on one thing and that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that our access to God is not based on who we used to be or who we're trying to become, but it's based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody said Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but it washed me. Anybody washed in the house today? Hallelujah. Anybody that can shout the victory because they know they've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your mercy. I say that again because I just can't get past the mercy of God. It's because of his mercy that we are not consumed. Yeah. Hallelujah. That was just the song. It's because of his mercy that we are not consumed. Because his compassion fails not and it is yeah. renewed every morning. Great yeah, is thank his you, faithfulness. Anybody can testify to that today. Great is his faithfulness. Only you know what the Lord has done in your life. On Only you know Hallelujah. what he has done for you. And I can testify testify on my own side that great has been his faithfulness in my life. Thank you, God. The scripture reading for today, we're going to the Old Testament, the Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 9. The Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 9. And our focus will be on a few verses out of uh, the verses 1 through 7. That's what we're going to read. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. And so if you'll turn in your electronic devices or your Bibles at this moment to that passage of Scripture, I'm going to wait for you to get there because I want you to read it along with me. Isaiah chapter 9. And if you're in the house and you're able to stand, I'm going to ask that you'll do so for the reading of God's Word. And if you are at home and you're able to stand, I'm going to ask that you stand in your own house for the reading of God's word. Isaiah chapter 9 in the New International Version, we find these words. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Mm -hmm. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Mm -hmm. 
the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Yes, Hallelujah. Somebody say something greater. Something greater. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today, Lord. And again, we bow before your majesty. I never get tired of talking to you, God. I never get tired of calling on your name. You said in times of trouble we could call on your name, but you also said that we could praise you with the fruit of our lips. You also said that we can worship you and we can rejoice in your presence. And so, God, I'm going to choose to do that. I'm going to choose to rejoice in your presence because I believe that in your presence there is fullness of joy. I really believe that today, God. And so I'm just going to rejoice in your presence presence. I believe that you have honored our request and set up your train in this house today, God. I believe that you have honored our request and that your presence is not only in us, but is among us even at this moment, God. And so I just want to say thank you. And I want to bow before your majesty. And I will declare that there is no God like you, God the Holy One of Israel. Hallelujah. There is no God like you, God. Oh my God. Help us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God. God, we give this preaching moment over to you, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, God, in this preaching moment. Lord, we get up here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and sometimes we wonder if this is ever making any difference at all, and we get weary and heavy laden. But God, you told us to be faithful, and you would do the rest. And so, God, I'm standing before you, trying to be faithful, trying to do what you have called me to do. But I confess that I need your help because I do not know how to preach. I confess that I need your help because I do not know how to teach. I need you to do what you do. Do what? you do for your honor and for your glory not for me but for your honor and for your glory and so God I pray as I always do for listening ears I pray that there are people on the other side of the camera as well as inside this building that have ears that are ready to hear what your word has to say. Let us not come for form or fashion or because we're, it's the right thing to do or because we're, and our mind is in 10 different places, God. Help us to focus today, God. Oh, God, we need a word of hope today, God. There's so much going on. And, and, and you know that. I don't know why I keep telling you that because you already know that. But God, our hearts are hurting. And I know you know that too, and we need a word of hope. And so God, I pray for listening ears. I pray for listening ears. Let us hear what the Spirit of God has to say to the church. I pray for listening ears. I pray for hearts that are willing to receive your truth. Hallelujah, God. I pray that the singing has broken up the fallow ground and that the atmosphere has been set for your word and that people will be receptive to your word. And God, I pray for responsive lives. Help us to respond to your truth, to live your truth. Not just in our everyday life, but in big ways. Help us to begin to think bigger about your kingdom. Expand us, enlarge our territory, enlarge our sphere of influence, enlarge our ability to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. Enlarge us because you have shown yourself to be faithful. You have proven yourself to be faithful to those who will submit to you. And so we submit afresh to you, God, in the name of Jesus. Have your way in this preaching moment. And for his sake, we pray always, amen and amen. Today, today is the second Sunday, you all may be seated. Today is the second Sunday in the Advent season. In simple terms, Advent is a season that focuses on the anticipation of the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ. Advent, in simple terms, is a season that focuses on the anticipation of his arrival. I don't know about you, but I'm often guilty of thinking about Advent in very superficial terms. I often don't dive into the depth of it, at least until God, by way of his spirit, calls me to think about it in a more profound way. 
And so as I was preparing to come before you today, I uh, decided to look at what some of the uh, profound theologians that I've studied about have to say about Advent. And I want to share with you what Dietrich Bonhoeffer has to say about the season of Advent. For those of you that don't know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's a, he was a Lutheran pastor and German theologian of the 20th century. His writings about Christ are profound. You have to read them, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He once stated with respect to Advent, he said that the celebration of Advent is only possible to those who are troubled in their soul. The celebration of Advent is only possible for those who are troubled in their soul. It's only possible for those who know themselves to be poor and imperfect and who look forward to something greater on the horizon. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, let's just be honest with ourselves, and we're looking at ourselves in the light of God's holiness, we are a poor and imperfect people. If we look at ourselves honestly in the light of God's holiness, we are find that there is trouble in the natural man's soul. But the only way, according to Reverend Bonhoeffer, that we can truly celebrate Advent is to look forward to something greater. That messes me up. Somebody say something greater. The necessity for something greater, most of you know, begins in eternity past. We're going to get to Isaiah in a minute, but I want to bring you up to that point. Is that all right? The necessity for something greater begins in eternity past. For when you look in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we find that God the Father is in conversation with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And God says, let us make man in our image. Let us make man after our likeness so that he may rule over all of creation. You'll find that in Genesis 1 and 26. And if you follow through with the story or the history of, of man's creation, you'll find that God goes ahead and he forms man of the dust of the ground and he enters into covenant relationships with man he gives him dominion over the all things that are created and he places him in a garden man is deceived by the enemy of God Satan himself man is deceived and man makes the conscious choice to disobey God and their relationship is broken their relationship is broken their spiritual connection is broken and the man is cast out of the garden and goes on to live life separated from God if you fast forward in the Bible, you will find that there is a man by the name of Abram that God calls unto Abram. And the Bible says that Abram obeys the voice of God and it's counted unto him for righteousness. God promises Abram, whose name then becomes Abraham, that he will make a great nation of him and that he will allow his descendants to dwell in a land of milk and honey. Come on, somebody, help me me with this. God says, Abraham, if you will obey me, I will make a great nation out of you and I will allow all of your descendants to live in a land of milk and honey. His descendants become known as the nation of Israel. That nation prospers under the leadership of God but then falls into Egyptian bondage for a period of over 400 years. And when Israel was finally released from Egyptian bondage and they go through a period of 40 years in the wilderness, they end up in the land of milk and honey. And after all that God has done for them, they disobey. 
after and the whole way through God has been pulling them through and because they're human because they've been separated from God uh, because of what happened in the garden and even though they made a covenant with God they disobey and when Israel finally gets to this land they still disobey and the Bible says that God sends prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet to beg them to give their hearts back to him he has claimed Israel as his bride. He is Israel's husband. There's a covenant that goes on there, but Israel continues to take their heart away from God and they disobey and God sends prophet after prophet. I love you. I want you. I, I want to be in relationship with you. Come back to me. And God sends prophet after prophet. And Isaiah is one of those prophets. If you research Isaiah, you'll find that he serves as the political and the religious counsel to the nation of Israel. Now that's powerful. That's a powerful position to have. Isaiah serves as the political and the religious counsel to the nation of Israel. What's so powerful about the name Isaiah is what it means. His name means the Lord is salvation. Oh my goodness. And so you understand a little bit about what the message uh, that comes from Isaiah, even though you may not have read the book in its fullness before because it's a long book but I'll tell you that he's one of the prophets that go to the nation of Israel and he begins to tell them that God loves them and that they ought to turn their hearts back to them and his name means the Lord is salvation Isaiah is often called the messianic prophet you know why? Because he speaks the most about the something greater that we're talking about. He's the Messianic prophet, which means he talks the most about the Messiah. The Messiah being the anointed and the appointed one that God sends to in order to bridge the gap that has developed between he and mankind. Isaiah, the Lord is salvation. The Messianic prophet who speaks about something greater that is to come. He speaks of the one who will come from the seed of David. He speaks of the one who will be out of the stump of Jesse. He speaks of the one who will come with a purpose and the plan to forever change the relationship, the broken relationship between God and not just Israel, but all of mankind. Somebody ought to say something greater, something greater. Rather than follow God, Israel decides to follow those who are in position of leadership. Uh, they have dethroned God. God really isn't their leader anymore. They've asked for a human king, and those kings lead them away from the heart of God. Those kings lead them into a place of empty ritualism. You know what empty ritualism is? Is when we begin to do things because it seems like the right thing to do. When we begin to do things out of habit. When we begin to do things not because we love God so much or because we want to honor what he said, but we're doing it because it's out of habit. And the kings of the nation of Israel began to lead them into empty rituals and they began to lead them into a place of idolatry. And the message from the prophet is, turn your heart back to God or you're gonna to have to deal with his wrath under the nation of Assyria. There is turmoil in the land. There is turmoil in the land. The Bible says if you look at the passages or the verses that are just before chapter 9, if you look at chapter 8, verses 19 through 22, you will find that there is turmoil in the land. The Bible says that Israel is distressed. The Bible says that Israel is hungry. The Bible says that Israel is enraged. The Bible says there is political upheaval. Hallelujah. How many of you think that sounds kind of familiar with some of the things that were going on today? Amen. How many of you know that there's nothing in the Bible or there's nothing that's going on today that catches God by surprise? How many of you know that there's nothing that's going on today that didn't happen in the Bible? We look at every generation and we say, this is crazy. Every generation is getting crazier and crazier. But let me tell you, nothing's happening today that didn't already happen in the Bible and for which God has a remedy. There is turmoil in the land. There is hunger in the land. People are distressed. People are enraged. There is political upheaval. 
It is during this time that Isaiah begins to prophesy about the something greater that is to come. And I want to tell you, that's what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks. The something greater that is to come. How many of you know that if you even, even take a page from today, you'll know that it's dark right now. It's dark. The world is dark. Come on, let's, let's apply this to everyday life. The world is dark. There is turmoil in the land. We are surrounded by people that are distressed. Amen. Every time you turn on the TV, the number goes up of people that are succumbing to this dreadful virus. They're calling us being in a war zone. Uh, you know, I, I, I try not to turn on the news as soon as I wake up every morning because when I see the number, they're now saying that every 36 seconds, someone is succumbing to this virus. Virus. I can't even wrap my brain around this. It's a dark time right now. There is turmoil in the land. You and I are surrounded by people that are distressed. How many of you know that at the end of this month, the moratorium on evictions will be up? And there are people that don't know where they're going to live on December 31st because they don't have a job and they don't have any money to pay their rent. And the moratorium that says that the landlord can't throw you out goes away on December 31st. So guess what happens on January? January 1st. There is turmoil in the land. People are in distress and it might not be one of us but there are people all around us that are in turmoil in the land. Every one of us know at least one person who has either suffered from that virus or has even passed away. There is turmoil going on in the land and when we look around we see people that are hungry. We see people that are in the very same place that Israel is. There are people that are hungry. Uh, every couple of Thursdays I go and I I help with a pop-up food pantry at one of the local churches and I'm telling you we don't even start till one o'clock but at 12 15 there's a sea of about 50 cars lined up down the street there's a sea of 50 cars that fill the whole parking lot people are angry they're busted and disgusted if you don't line them up right in the parking lot they're mad and they're telling you off as you hand them food there's turmoil in the land because people are distressed there's turmoil in the land because people are hungry there's turmoil in the land because people are afraid there is turmoil in the land because of all that we're living through right now there's political upheaval in the land we're not any different than the nation of Israel in the text come on somebody we're not any different amen we tend to look at the Bible and we look at Israel and we look at Israel with disdain or we look at them like how come they didn't know better and we're living the same way we're living with the same stuff we're struggling with the same stuff and our hearts may not be in the right place as we're struggling through this there is turmoil in the land there is political upheaval we have a president who won't leave so the next one can get in line there's political upheaval in the land but I came to remind you that it won't always be dark I came to remind you that even though darkness is in the land it's not always going to be dark something greater is on the way and that's what Advent is all about it's about the anticipation of that which is to come it's about the anticipation of the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ it won't always be this way somebody tell you somebody tell your neighbor if you got one I'm so glad that trouble don't last all way I'm so glad it seems like it's gone on a long time it's been about nine Nine months we've been in this and it seems like we're going deeper and deeper but I'm so glad that help is on the way I'm so glad that something greater is on the way I'm so glad that trouble don't last always oh yeah there's turmoil in the land right now but there won't always be and the prophet Isaiah has something to say to us. He says, there will come a time. You got to read it for yourself when you go home. There will come a time when there will be no more gloom for the people of God who are currently in distress. Come on, somebody. Lift up your head, all right? There will be a time when there will be no more gloom for the people of God who are currently in distress. Isaiah talks about two territories in the nation of Israel. Zebulun, this is going to be a little bit of teaching here. Is that all right? Zebulun and Naphtali. These were the first tor territories in Israel to suffer the invasion of Assyria. Thus, they were the beginning of the dark days for the people of Israel. But the Bible says, Isaiah says, even though that happened, there are people that are walking in the midst of a dark season, but they have seen a great light. How many of you have seen a great light? His name is Jesus Christ. There are people that are walking in the midst of a dark season that have been under attack, and they're the first ones that have been under attack. But the people of God have seen 
seen a great light. Come on, somebody. We have seen a great light. I love the way that Isaiah speaks of the one who is to come as though he has already come. Did you ever check that out in the text? I don't know about you, but I pay attention to how the scripture is written. I pay attention to the tense. I pay attention to pronouns. I pay attention to those kind of things because I'm trained to read scripture that way. But how many of you know that Isaiah speaks of the something greater who is to come as though he has already come and he wasn't going to come for 600 more years, at least in the flesh 600 more years but Isaiah says the people have seen a great light as though they've already seen it the people have seen a great light as though he has already come the prophet Isaiah says the people have seen a great light how many of you have seen the light of Christ how many of you see the light of Christ right now in the midst of all of the darkness how many of you see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ how many of you see him hallelujah how many of you see him those who are distressed but have eyes to see see the great light we may be distressed but we have eyes to see and we see the great light those who have ears to hear now hear the sound of victory even when it seems like it can't get any worse people that know God and have seen the great light have we now hear the sound of victory come on somebody I don't know about you but I hear the sound of victory hallelujah not only is something greater on the way but someone greater is on the way hallelujah in the midst of the darkness the light has dawned the prophet says to Israel God will shatter the yoke of Assyria and every other foreign power that comes up against you Israel oh come on you got to make this thing personal you got to make this thing personal God says uh, Isaiah says God will shatter the yoke of Assyria and every foreign power that comes up against you God will shatter believer the yoke of the enemy that comes up against the people of God hey 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 I know we're a little distressed right now I know we're hurting in our spirit I know that the enemy has come in like a flood but the Bible says that God will shatter the yoke of the enemy that comes up against the people of God Isaiah says you God you have enlarged the nation of Israel and you have increased her joy hallelujah 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 I don't know about you but at the very thought of Jesus my joy starts to leave I don't know about you when my head is turned down and I'm sobbing in my spirit and I'm grieving and I'm feeling beat down and I'm feeling distressed all I have to do is think about the something greater that has come and will come again all I have to do is think about the love of Jesus and my joy begins to get complete again my joy raises up it my joy begins to a leap in my body have you ever been in a situation where your joy starts to leap and you can't sit still your head is all messed up and you're struggling and you're crying but then you think about the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and the joy begins to get complete in you again weeping may endure for a night but joy is going to come because something greater is on the way weeping may endure for the night but joy is going to come because something greater is really someone greater help me somebody preach this thing just like people rejoice when their crops come. Most of the people in Israel were agriculturalists. And so they would plant crops. They didn't go to the bank to go to work or to the hospital to go to work. They would plant crops. And when the crops began to have a harvest, the Bible says that the people would rejoice. It says that when their men went out and began to fight in battle and they won the battle, they would come back with what they got from the, they call it the spoil, whatever they got from the battle, what they got from the enemy, and they come back and they would rejoice about it. Hallelujah. That's the kind of rejoicing that goes on when we think about Jesus because we know that we're in warfare we know that we're in spiritual warfare but how many of you just walk right up into the enemy's camp and begin to take back what he stole from you and on your way back to your house you're just doing a little party like this right here because you know that God has been faithful and you know that the battle has been fought and the victory has been won but you wouldn't have that joy if something greater hadn't come you wouldn't have that joy if someone greater had not come the prophet talks about Midian. You remember the story of Midian. That's when Gideon led the army of Israel with just 300 men in Judges chapter 7. And how they 
were oppressed by the Midianites, the nation of Israel, for years and years and years. And God said, I'm going to use you, Midian, and I'm going to use you, Gideon, and I want you to narrow it down to 300 men, and you're going to go in there, and you're going to handle this business. And the Bible says, you got to read the story in Judges 7. It'll just blow your mind. And the Bible says that when the Midianites were aroused from their sleep, getting ready to go and destroy Israel, that God confounded them, and they began fighting each other and beating each other down and stabbing each other, and they ran away and Israel got the victory because God confused the enemy how many of you know that because of the blood of Jesus we have joy inside of us so that when the enemy comes in up against us we can praise God and bless God and worship God and the sound of victory and the sound of worship will confuse the enemy hallelujah we have the victory and the Bible says in Isaiah that the people will rejoice because they know they have already won because something greater has come Israel's been fighting their enemies for a long time, always in and out of battle. You and I, we've been fighting the enemy for a moment. We've been fighting the enemy. If you just be honest with yourself, you don't have to say nothing, but if you be honest with yourself, we've been fighting the enemy for a season, but there will come a day, according to the word of Isaiah, that the combat material will no longer be needed. There will come a day when the boots that we put on to go into the enemy's camp will no longer be necessary. There will come a day when the armor that we put on every day to go in and fight warfare spiritually against the enemy will no longer be necessary there will come a day when we take all of that off and we throw it into the fire for burning that's what Isaiah has to say how many of you know that that's just good news hallelujah that all of the weapons that we fight with there will be one day where we won't have to use them anymore hallelujah because let me tell you something about what Advent is about Advent of course is about the celebration of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and that something greater is really someone greater but those of us that know that he already came we're looking for the second advent hallelujah we're looking for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he cracks the sky and the old folks say I don't have to study war no more I can put my boots down I can put my spiritual armor down I can put it all down because I'll be in the presence of my great God but the second advent could not happen unless the first advent happened so believers ought to be shouting the victory right now believers ought to be shouting the victory right now if it had not been for the Lord on my side I'd be on my way to a devil's hell if it had not been for the Lord on my side I'd be defeated but because the Lord was on my side I have victory and because the Lord is on my side I'm looking forward to the second advent when he cracks the sky and takes me on home how many of you know he's coming back again just like he said he would how many of you know I know we celebrate in the first advent amen but I'm also looking forward to the second advent when he comes to take me home Something greater is actually someone greater in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel is looking in the text for the first advent. You and I celebrate the first advent, but recognize if there had not been a first advent, there would not be a second advent. Something greater is someone greater. He's come and he will return. And when he returns, he'll break the yoke of the oppressor. Hallelujah. That brings a smile to my face. I hit this monkey off my back finally because he's trying to take me out. And when that someone greater comes back, he'll break the yoke of the oppressor and he will call his children home. I don't know about you, but for the last week, I've been watching on Facebook 5,000 pictures of the Grinch. He's in Cannonsburg. And the first couple days, I was like, that is so cool. Isn't that wonderful? Spirit of Christmas, isn't it wonderful? But after about the 10th day, I said, who's going to talk about Jesus? Is anybody going to talk about who the real reason for the season is? And I see that somebody raised some cane because there's a nativity scene out there now. Somebody asked some question. The, the Grinch is cool. I'm going to watch it with my grandchildren on Christmas Day. But the main thing's got to be the main thing. The Lord Jesus Christ is the someone greater 
who came to set the captives free. The Lord Jesus Christ is the someone greater that came down through 40 and two generations with the intent to set not only Israel free from the yoke of bondage, but all of mankind free from the yoke of bondage. The someone greater is the Lord Jesus Christ. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And I love the fact that the government will be on his shoulders. He has all the authority now. People just don't want to honor that. But in that day, he will surely have all of the authority. There will be no senator that you have to write to to beg him to do something. There will be no Congress people that you're mad at regardless of their political party. There will be no presidents who refuse to leave so the other can't come in. There will be no prime ministers who sanction or don't sanction the new president elect. There will just be him the Lord Jesus Christ, everything will come to rest on him. And the Bible says that the zeal of God, God will be excited about putting all of the authority on the Lord Jesus Christ and his peace will last forever. You see the passage of scripture, if you really pay attention to it, doesn't just talk about the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It talks about the second coming as well. There are two messages in the midst of one passage of scripture. And if you are in Jesus, you ought to celebrate both messages. You ought to celebrate both messages. Someone greater has already come and someone greater is coming back again. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up. I know there's turmoil in the land. I know there's distress in the land. I know there's hunger in the land. I know people are angry in the land. Sometimes we're those people. Let's just be honest about it. Sometimes we're the angry people in the land. But lift up your heads, O ye gates and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come into your house and set up his presence lift up your heads O ye gates and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall invade your space the king of glory shall invade your way of thinking the king of glory shall invade your house lift up your heads who is the king of glory the lord strong and mighty the lord mighty in battle he is the king of glory Come on somebody, he is the lifter of my head. When I am in turmoil, when I am in distress, when I am in rage, when I am hunger, when I don't understand the complexity of this life, he is the lifter of our heads. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm holding on to that. I don't know about y'all, but I'm holding on to the word. I'm holding on to the word. It's in this day and age that you got to know the word because you'll be taken under if you don't know the word of God. There's some easier times, maybe three or four years ago, where you could just dog pedal on your own thinking. But today is the day of salvation and you got to know the word of God or it'll overtake you. This stuff will overtake you in your thinking. So I believe He's who he said he is. I believe that the someone greater has come and we'll celebrate that in a few weeks. I believe that the someone greater is the one who will take the yoke of the enemy off of those who are distressed. And if they'll bow down before him, they shall be saved. I believe. Why? 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 Because the grass will wither and the flowers will fade. But the word of God endures forever. The grass will wither. Come on, somebody. The flowers will fade, but the word, the word will stand forever. I was so excited when my daughter said to me, Mom, can I take one of your commentaries home with me? I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can I take one of your commentaries? I feel like I need to know the word more because she's feeling the stress of what's going on. She's feeling the stress, feeling the pain. I feel like I need to know the word more. Can I take one of your commentaries home? And, and last night she texted me and said, Mom, do you need your commentary? I know you got to preach tomorrow. I said, no, baby, I want you to, you, 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 to, you to have what you have. Have what you have. I got 10 more. I'm going to be all right I'm going to be all right but people need to know the word need to know what God says what does God have to say about the matter yeah we're distressed 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're cast down, but we're not forsaken. Amen. We're distressed because the word of God says he would never leave us and he would never forsake us. And so I praise God today for his word. Even in the season of difficulty, when our hearts are grieving, I praise God for the word of God. It sustains me. Because the Spirit of God ministers by way of the Word of God. Amen? Sometimes we're waiting on God to say something. God, say, throw some magic dust my way. Say something, God. God says, I talk out of my Word. I talk out of my Word. If you get in my Word, then we can have a conversation. But he speaks out of his Word. And so in this day and age, you've got to have the Word. And you've got to know that the something greater has come. And he's come just for you. The something greater is someone greater in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way that we as believers, I agree with Reverend Bonhoeffer, the only way that we can truly celebrate Advent is to recognize how troubled we are in our soul without Jesus. The only way we can truly celebrate Advent is to recognize how poor and imperfect we are and to be able to look forward to something greater. Amen. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. If you are not saved, I pray that you would not harden your heart. Jesus came to save you. I'm just going to make it as plain as I can. Jesus came to save those who are lost. He didn't come for those who already have it all together and think that they're perfect and think that they don't have any flaws and think they don't need a doctor. He came for the ones who said, I'm sick, God. I'm troubled in my soul. I got to have some help here. He came for them. And so if you're in that category, he's here for you. And for those of you that are in the other category, he's going to wait for you to decide that you need him. Amen? Amen. Amen. But tomorrow is not promised. And so I don't want you to think you got till tomorrow to figure this thing out because tomorrow is not promised. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear the spirit of the living God speaking to you, harden not your heart. This stuff is real. This is real. This is real. This is real. There's so many preachers prophesying that the, these are the last days. And I'm, I, I, you know, I always say, well, I'm not sure. I'm starting to believe that. I'm starting to believe that, these, that, that our days are numbered for sure. Amen. And so th this is no game. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you, harden not your heart. Yield before the authority of God and receive what God has to offer in the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If there's somebody on the other side of the camera that actually wants to have that conversation with you, with me, call me. Call me here at the church. We can talk over the phone. We can talk in person. I, you know, I'm not adverse to that at all. Um, but we need to have a conversation about what it means to be saved and what it means to be yoked up with Jesus Christ and what it means to look forward to something greater because someone greater has come. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today for your mercy. I, I just keep saying that, God, because I really recognize it's your mercy that suits my case. I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the someone greater in the person of Jesus Christ that you sent down through 40 and two generations to save a lost world. And so, God, I pray that you would prick the hearts of those who are unsaved today. Prick the hearts of those who are unsaved. Prick the hearts of those who are saved today that we might go home and talk to our families who are not saved and cause them to know by some way that you're the only way. I pray for that today, Lord. I pray that you would save folks today and save folks today. And I pray that you would strengthen the save today for the journey that continues and cause us to always be looking to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the first Sunday. And so we will move into this part of the worship experience that involves the Lord's Supper. It was on a Thursday that Jesus gathered together with his disciples for the last time on this side of life. It was on a Thursday. And the Bible says that when he, he got with the disciples, in that upper room, mm, stuff happens in the upper room. Um, but that when he got with those 12 disciples, that he said to them as he broke the bread, this is for you. This is for you. 
Think about that. The bread represents the body of Christ, which has been broken for us. And he said, do this in remembrance of me, remembering that I allowed my body to be pierced. I allowed nails to go into my hands and into my feet. This is for you as he broke the bread. And the Bible says when he took the cup, he supped with them and he said, this is what you ought to do in remembrance of me because this is the New Testament in my blood. How many of you know in the blood of Jesus, there's the opportunity to enter into covenant relationship with God. There is the opportunity for every man, woman, boy, girl. There is nobody that would be excluded from that. Every man, woman, boy, and girl has the opportunity to enter into covenant relationship with God because of the blood of Jesus. And so in the upper room, Jesus says, in this cup is the New Testament or the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, remember me. And as often as you do it, you show the Lord's death until he comes back, until the second advent. So every time we partake in the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of the crucifixion. We are reminded of the tremendous sacrifice. And we're showing that we are united together as a body covered by the blood of Jesus. And we commemorate that every time that we do it as one body until he comes back again until the second advent. Wow, that messes me up every time I think about that. And so we have before you pre-filled cups. Um, there's a breadcrumb at the bottom and there is grape juice at the top. And so we're going to pray over the elements and then we're gonna ask Ms. Minister Corey to give us our little communion song and then we will take it together, amen? amen. Father, again we come and we come lifting up these elements before you, God. We're thankful for uh, the bread that represents the body of, of your son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for the grape juice that represents the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We are thankful for that, Lord. And we just want to lift these elements up to you. We're praying over them right now that you would sanction them for this purpose and for this purpose only, God. We pray for the people that are under the sound of my voice, Lord, whether they're in the building or on the other side of the camera. If there is any sin in the camp... We ask for forgiveness right now, Lord. We repent of that thing right now in the name of Jesus so that when we partake of your supper, we're coming in a fashion that is deemed appropriate by your standard. Forgive us for the sins that we have committed. Forgive us for our wayward thinking. Forgive us for getting lost in the turmoil and not remembering that someone greater has already come. And so God, we just celebrate um, our life in the Lord Jesus Christ and we commemorate his death as we partake today. Thank you, Lord, in advance for what you shall do in our lives as we submit to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Bible says that when they concluded their time together in the upper room, they sang a hymn and they went out into the Mount of Olives. We know that Jesus was on his way to the cross then. We are leaving this Mount of Olives knowing that Jesus has already paid the price, amen? He has already paid the price on Calvary and it is my hope and my prayer that if you, as you leave this place, you're reminded of the price that was paid and you're reminded of the someone greater who did it all just for you. Amen. Who wouldn't want everybody to feel the joy that you feel as a believer? And so go out and share your joy. Amen. Go out and tell the story about the Lord Jesus Christ. That men, women, boys, and girls, that Cannonsburg would be saturated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you and God keep you. Those of you on the other side of the camera, we love you. God bless you. And we will see you again soon. Thank you and God be with you.